Don Wagner, who comes to us from California and who has been here before and spoken here before um, when she wrote her book, Firelight, which is the biography of Angel Decora, who was an important um, member of the Carl Indian School faculty, a Ho-Chunk um, teacher. And since then has written other very significant uh, pieces. She wrote a series for Indian Country Today about um, Angel Decora and basically exposed Angel Decora's husband, Lone Star Dietz, who's one of our, uh, our Native Carlisle Indian School, because you know I have tunnel vision. Um, Lone Star Dietz's um, coaching prowess at Carlisle is so important, and Linda exposed his um, duplicity, I guess you could say. He was a fake, he wasn't really Indian. And, you know, he's always been touted as this Indian coach. Um, he was a very significant, important part of Carlisle's story, but he was not native, you know. And, there were, and, and he's in the company of other important fakes, um, namely Ivan Miller, Jim Thorpe's wife, and also Sylvester Long, Chief Buffalo Child Longlands, who, you know, we had hoped we could somehow highlight here because Longlands was a Carlisle graduate who passed himself off as Native and who um, wrote, it, wrote a bio an autobiography about himself. But I digress. Maybe we can get to that in our panel. Um, but Linda is also the researcher extraordinaire and has really gotten us out of a little tricky situation here at the Historical Society. And if anybody wants to hear the story, we'd love to tell you <laughs> But, you know, I'll just leave the mystery for later. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Linda Wagner. to be here. Um, also, my fellow presenters, thank you for setting me up so wonderfully well because my work crosses over all of yours. Um, I only have a few things that I'm going to read because I'm really trying to kind of let the slides speak. I have a lot of images um, that I wanted to show um, to you. So let's get going and see what I can have. Is this the thing that works for? I guess I could just use this. Did you just use the computer? Okay. This is Lillian Redwing Saints. Um, this picture was taken in Manhattan in 1948, uh, probably for a photographer for the New York Times because she was being featured in a column. This little outfit she's wearing might give you all different reactions, um, especially the fact that a woman is wearing headdress like that. Um, she made pretty much everything she's wearing herself. She was an extraordinary leader, extraordinary. She worked with, uh, she made headdresses for tons of Native people and also uh, hobbyists, like Clyde talks about. So this dress, we were going to try to get here today at the museum, but there were some problems getting it. It's actually at the Wisconsin State Historical Society, and is supposed to be the dress she wore in her most famous role uh, as Natchi Rich in Squaw Man. And sorry that I'm going to be saying the words why I wouldn't normally say that, but just today it's too complicated for, for me not to let it come out of my mouth. Um, anyway, what do you think about this woman? This is how she looked. This is how she was in 1948. So I was fortunate recently to land, to get some of Lillian St. Cyr's things, things that somebody had in a file when she died. It was just one of those miraculous events where I was so frustrated that I don't have any of her letters, I don't have anything personal, 
And then I met somebody through the internet, and they said, well, you should have this. And they gave me a Lillian Red Wings file. It had her medical card in it, it had her tribal card, it had, um, let's see, it had pictures, it had some letters, but what it also had is two handwritten autobiographies, which is amazing to find. So because um, I think it's important for, to let people, maybe people speak for themselves, I'm gonna read. What I did is I combined the two autobiographies in, into one. So this is her words. She's actually writing this probably to send to somebody to write about her. Lillian St. Cyr Red Wing, a Winnebago Indian woman born on the Winnebago Reservation, February 18, 1884. Can you hear me back there, by the way? Sorry, I'm not saying it. Um, is the youngest daughter of Michelle St. Cyr and Julia DeCora, both prominent families of the Winnebago tribe. Attended reservation grade school, later graduated from the famous Carlisle School in 1902, after graduation, was a protege of Senator Long of Kansas. Came to New York City where a talent scout engaged her for a picture at the Kalem Studios in Fort Lee for a part in The White Squaw. And was the first Indian girl to be featured or starred in the silent movies. Also appeared for Reuben Company of Philadelphia in The Falling Arrow with Mary Pickford in The Mended Loot for Biograph and Dove Eyes Gratitude and Red Wings Loyalty for Biograph Later joined the New York Motion Picture Company to go to California to appear in many Indian and Western pictures where it became known as Bison Films under Tom Ince. About 1910, Pathé Brothers came to America. They were uh, Pathé Frères, they were from France. And I signed a contract with them for Western and Indian films known as the Pathé Westerns. We had our own studios at Edendale and Hoot Gibson, Jack Hoxie, Mill Brown, Phoebe Daniels and Louis Stone were some of the actors who worked for us. After my own company broke up, I want to uh, stop here for a moment. Her company was with her husband, James Young Deer, known as James Young Deer. She does not mention him at all in this autobiography. <laughs> There's reasons for that, um, as you'll see. Okay. Um, so after my own company broke up, I played opposite Tom Mix, Mix and Seelig's production, The Thundering Herd. I also worked for Seelig Company playing Ramona's mother in Ramona, and this is the first film version of Ramona. Playing the Indian lead as Natchewich in the first picture Cecil DeMille made, and the film which started him on his road to fame and fortune. The Squaw Man opposite Dustin, oh, and played in the Squaw Man opposite Dustin Farnham, the stage star. After I left Hollywood, I bought the state's rights for the Tom Mix pictures I played in and traveled in many states with the pictures giving an educational program in conjunction with the pictures. Then returned to New York and worked in the famous Bellevue Hospital as an occupational therapist, had a large class of boys and enjoyed my work with them. As you know, most Indians have an English name in addition to their Indian name, and my two names are Lillian St. Cyr and Red Wing. At present, I appear on television programs at times, and I also make Indian costumes and war bonnets for the television and theatrical trades show, trades here in New York. Also give educational programs in public schools. Despite all my travels and experiences, my Indian heritage, of which I am most proud, is strong within my heart. And I return to my people every chance I get, and there is a cherished part in my heart for the state of Nebraska, especially the little corner of the state where I was born and while, where all my loved ones are at rest. So I really, really wanted to talk to you about Lillian's amazing family, her family of origin, but there just isn't time to do that. Um, also, what, where these, where they, what their origins are. Let me just suffice it to say that if you've heard the new statistic that siblings raise, siblings have more an effect on, on children than their parents, this is especially true for Lillian. This is the annuity roll in 1884 that first shows that she is born. Lily, born February 1884. It also shows her father's initial St. Cyr, his wife Julia, her oldest brother David, next Julia, Annie, Minnie, Louis, Lily, and um, there was a, a little girl, Pauline, that time. If you look below that, though, Lily, there is another wife called Neil Hunting in Cobb. She's very young, and I'm not sure if he, 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 he 
did have plural marriage with another woman, which I'll show you later, but I'm not sure if um, that's because, on this census, Julia has died in 1885. Um, so her mother died right after she was born. So she was born, well, a year after she was born. This had a great effect on her life, obviously. Um, and then the second wife went to Wisconsin. So this is taken in Nebraska. She went to Wisconsin, so she's gone. Uh, Lillian's father, Mitchell St. Cyr, who's shown in the middle front row there, and her brother David, who's shown on the far left, were part of the delegation to go to Washington, D.C. for the Winnebago in 1881. Her father was, uh, I actually call them Ho Chunk Metis. The, they're from a, the St. Cyr, it's a French name, obviously. They're actually, uh, you know, called mixed blood or half breed, all those kind of weird names. But um, so they really kind of had a different outlook on how she was raised. But at the same time, uh, so he believed in educating his children, um, he was Catholic. Her mother was more traditional. Her mother's from the Decorah family, but she really didn't have much time to be influenced by M Michelle because he died somewhere between 1887 and 1888 when she was not even four years old. So there's a family, a family tree here. This shows all the children. It also shows um, her, she's the big one over here, Margaret Lillian St. Cyr, and that's the fifth daughter. That's her birth order name. Um, and her spouses, James Young, Younger Johnson, a.k.a. Young Deer, another person that fortunately was not native, um, though it, we found that he does probably have some um, Nanticoke ancestry, but he portrayed himself as a Winnebago. So I keep getting, for some reason, these people are attracted to me. They like to come to see me. But fortunately, I did not have to out that. Someone outed it before I did. Um, and then she has a second husband that is called LeClaire. I'm not really sure if, if that was the case. She, he only shows up on two years on tribal records. Uh, it may just be an alias for her husband Johnson, and we'll come to why that he would need an alias in a little bit. And then a very, very brief marriage with a guy named Jay, uh, Joe Eaglefoot, who was a performer in New York and probably was not native either. Then, at the end of her life, she lived for a while with a Japanese actor who was supposedly in, um, uh, what's the King of Siam movie? King the King and I. Yeah, so I don't know what production of The King and I, if it was a movie or something in New York, they were living in New York. Um, so she was, you know, she was good with diversity. She came from a very diverse family, though. So the people that actually end up being important in her life later are the, are the siblings that, and the siblings' children that move with her to New York. So Julia, number two, ends up living in Manhattan. I wanted to talk more about her, but I won't be able to. She, um, she actually gets hit by a truck. Um, the two, two of the family get hit by cars in Manhattan, which is horrible. She was quite elderly, as you can see, when she died. She didn't ever really legally marry, except for maybe the second husband. The first, uh, her, the, her first child, Leo, was actually the half-sibling of, if you know, George Whitewing, who's made famous in um, the painting by, I'm spacing out on the name right now. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, <laughs> that painter, it'll come to me. Dorothea Lane's husband. Oh. Okay, it'll come to me. Um, and so then there's Annie St. Cyr. Minnie St. Cyr is the other important person in her, in her life because her children are also getting moved to New York. So uh, Michael, also, or Michelle, they, they called him Mitchell with a T because that's how they would have pronounced Michelle and Mitchell. Um, his other wife that was he was married to or having relationships with, at the same time, Lillian's mother, had three children. The first, I don't believe, was his, but the second two are really important at this school, Abner and Levi St. Cyr. So they are Carlisle graduates. All of these, and then all of these brothers are all married to Frenchmen women. They're called, that's their last name, Frenchmen, and those Frenchmen are all sisters. 
So the second part of the family um, from Minnie is Albina Lone Deer Lowry, who ends up in Brooklyn. She dies in Brooklyn. Her husband dies in Brooklyn. Their baby boy dies in Brooklyn. Their daughter, Josephine, dies in New York. And their son, um, Louis Green Rainbow Bossy, is still living. I talked to him. And he's, and he's a dancer, he's a Palo dancer. You know? Yeah. Yeah, okay, he's still living in New York. And then one, others, uh, one other of the, her sibling's sisters also lived in New York. So those are the, the people that end up being important to her in her life. So this is a picture of Mitchell St. Cyr, kind of the ethnographic picture. He's called a half caste. You know, um, some people, sometimes he's listed as white, but he is actually, um, he was actually adopted into the St. Cyr family. He's actually stock and uh, with an unknown, probably white father, you know, biologically, but he was very much Winnebago culturally, as much as the French ones were. So he um, he basically kind of sets a standard for the family to sort of stand up for their rights, and um, and because of that. Julie, the older, older sister, becomes known as the first Indian uh, woman lawyer. She's not a real, you know, sort of trained lawyer, but he sets a precedent for the kids to not only get a, to get an education, but to also stand up for the for their tribal rights. This is the other special um, item that was in the stuff I got. It's just, it's a letter that Lillian had in this envelope, and she carried it around with her for years and years and years. <coughs> I'm just going to read it because it's hard to read. So he's writing this letter to Annie, to the older sister, who is either teaching somewhere near the reservation, and they're living maybe <coughs> on the reservation, but um, away from home or this may have been written in Philadelphia, which I'll talk to you. And Annie at this point, so the mother's died, and Annie at this point is taking care of Lillian, who is, is Lilia in this letter. My dear lovely daughters, let me just say one thing. I, I know there's that Indian talk where people, they don't speak, they speak broken English. Well, Michelle probably spoke French, and he, he could write, um, he usually got a scribe to write for him if he was writing to government officials, but this is a letter he's writing to his daughter, so I'm just going to read it how he said it. I'm trying to write you a few lines, let you know I am well, and I hope my few lines will find you the same help. Papa thinking about you all the times. Kiss my little girl, tell her Papa, send her his kiss, and that's for, for Lillian. Take good care of, this is one of those crying ones, okay, Barbara, what? Try not to. Take good care of your little sister. Me and David still living alone yet. Minnie has not come home, yet I hope you are contented. I hope you will not get lonesome. I'm keeping house. I'm keeping house. My eyes are the same. So he had trachoma, which was really ran ramp rampant on reservations. And you can see that probably in his picture. His eyes are off a little bit. Um, the times are dull at this agency. Now, my dear child, take good care of yourself. Be honest, a true girl, so you can have a good name and can be trusted anywhere. I know you are a good girl. I am proud of it all the time. You must excuse me to not have written to you more often. I can't see good enough, but I guess by all my written or writing, this is all I hope my few lines will find you and your sister in good health. Tell Lilia the little pony is big now. From your father, Mitchell St. Cyr. So, unfortunately, right after he wrote this letter, he died. I don't have any record of his death. Um, all I know is he doesn't show up on um, census records anymore. So basically all the children kind of, some of them banded together, but they, they show up as orphans now on the census records. So what happened was, um, and most people have never talked about this, but Lillian gets sent away, at least with one of her sisters, to Philadelphia from Nebraska. And every, she talks about, and the thing that's so interesting to me, the reason I read you her autobiography, is she doesn't talk about this. She talks about Carla. So the things she writes about are those things that are famous, the things she's proud of. But she actually was sent away to Philadelphia to go to the Lincoln Institute 
which I discovered was actually kind of one of those schools that funneled in their students into Carlisle. They had an Episcopal chapel, they baptized kids, they baptized her brother Lewis, I found her sister Annie um, on, as a witness to a baptism. And this uh, place, the building is still there, but um, so this is the building as appeared in 1865. But anyway, they put on a production of Pinafore. And the Philadelphia Times uh, had a reviewer who wrote about it. They were all excited because they were, you know, the audience was expecting it to be kind of boring, but they or not, uh, you know, not as good as what a white bunch of kids would do. And they were just pleasantly surprised how good it is. And so at, on this, um, this was just one of those freaks things that I found. Oxy Gahoniga, or little, or Lily Saint Cyr, a pretty and phenomenally bright Sue girl of five years. And Sue is often what people put if they don't know. Um, dressed in a handsome suit of crimson silk, evoked hearty applause and many charming compliments. So this is probably Lillian's first appearance as a performance at five years old, which is absolutely wonderful. She must have enjoyed it because she continued on. So. This is as the building looks today. It's there on 30, 324 South 11th Street. And then um, what I'm showing you here is that um, from the Omaha World Herald in 1913, I got a little bit more information about where she was in Philadelphia she, and that she entered kindergarten there. Um, it's, she, was, uh, she lived with Senator uh, Long of Kansas later in life, and it's saying that she lived with his family then, which I still haven't found to be true. I'm not sure. I still don't really know who she lived with. But I do know that a lot of her family at this time uh, ends up in Philadelphia. So her sister is also, his name also shows up in Pinafore. Her brother is at the school, the educational home, which is right next door in kind of the brother's school of the Lincoln Institute. Her sister, Minnie, uh, who was a uh, a Genoa Indian school grad from Nebraska is appointed nurse in Philadelphia. Her other, uh, her, the woman would be her sister-in-law, Annie Frenchman, is baptized in Lincoln Institute, and then Annie St. Cyr witnesses the baptism. So this family stuck together. These siblings really stuck together. So that kind of was very encouraging to find that out. And then later, um, uh, her older sister is teaching at the Winnebago Reservation School in 1893. Then her brother enrolls at Hampton Institute in Virginia. November, Minnie, Minnie, the sister Minnie marries Benjamin Lowry in Winnebago. David St. Cyr is an interpreter at Winnebago. Annie St. Cyr marries St. Pierre Owen in Winnebago. So you can see they're all kind of going back home and, and kind of trying to create a life for themselves. In 1894, her half-brother Levi is employed here. He's already graduated in 1891 as a printer at Carlisle. And then in October, Lillian St. Cyr arrives at Carlisle. And this is what Barb gave me. This is the information from her, I guess, her file. And um, it's a little bit confusing, but basically she comes in in 1894 and she graduates in 1902. And as you can see, she's also a tiny little thing. I have no idea why that didn't show up. So that, yeah, it's not even showing up. It's funny. So this was the census for Carlisle, which shows her in the census with all the other kids. It's not showing up. OK, so um, Mark has given me uh, some things from the, from, the, uh, from the Arrow, and also, or sorry, Indian Helper, and also I found some things online. That, so in 1900, she's been assisting in this. Is, Ms. Lukenbach's office for several days. Later on, she talks about that she's had experience in office work in Philadelphia, so I think that's it. Um, then this one I love. There was a lively challenge debate at the Susan Literary Society last Friday night between the girls of number 10 and 11. Subject, resolved that poverty causes more crime than wealth. Affirmative, Lily St. Cyr, Kate Johnson, and Jenny. <laughs> and then the negative, I love that. So good for her, she's on the right side on that one. And then um, in the program of last Friday evening at the Susans, Lily St. Cyr, blah, 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 appeared in appropriate costumes as the seasons and showed careful <coughs> or quotations. So, so a little more performance. <coughs> then she's playing Morning in a Tableau, again, at the Susan Longworth Literary Society. And then she's also doing clerical work. 
So this is my, I love this picture. This is just the gorgeous picture of the St. Cyr siblings. Um, so this is Lillian. Um, and I, I determined that this was taken between 1898 and 1900 because Lewis arrives in 1898. He actually kind of gets, doesn't really get kicked out of Hampton, but they don't really want him anymore there. So he gets into Carlisle. And then um, Levi, I was always confused by this because I said he graduated in 1891, but as he's employed by the government in the printing office, he's still there, but he goes home to get married in, in 1900. So, and this is a choke picture, which I did not write down. Here she is listed later in the class of 1902 as Lillian St. Cyr Johnston from Edendale, California. And then this is the graduate picture, which is really blurry, but I could not find her in it. So I don't know if it's because she left in February. I'm not really sure who this picture was taken. So after graduation, um, you know how the Redemption Helper keeps track of everyone. And so they said that she um, plans to start school again in September 1st. She intends to clinch the lessons driven in at Carlisle. We hope and expect always to hear of her that she's living a life of earnest endeavor in the right direction. And then in September, Miss Lily St. Cyr, class of 02, who is at her home in Nebraska, is expecting to return east this fall to take a postgraduate course somewhere. A lot of times that meant they were going to be teachers for like the normal school and get that little diploma um, like Hampton <coughs> And then in January of 03, she, Lillian St. Cyr, class of two, was in Kansas with Ella Romero, which I thought was interesting, with because uh, uh, Romero Ho Chunk, that is now today, um, who is ill. Lillian has remained out of school this winter on account of her own health. She says she's enjoying her freedom from school duties, but has not given up the idea of taking a higher course. She reads considerably, takes music lessons, and has recently united with the church. Thank God. <laughs> Now, this is my other prize position. I will be unfolding this picture as the lecture goes on. This is my secret, one of those things where you find and you don't want to show anybody. Um, it was given to me many years ago by the tribal historian in, in Winnebago, Nebraska. He gave me this picture and another picture and said, one of these I think is Angel Decora. Well, one of them ended up being Julia, Angel Decora's sister, and the other one was this picture, which I just kept for a long time thinking, oh, it's a beautiful picture. And I just had it in, you know, like a plastic thing. And then um, for some reason, one day after I started working on this, it was on my coffee table. I had no idea how I got there. And somebody had talked to me about the, the St. Cyr dimples because they have dimples in their chin. And that picture was sitting there looking at me. And I looked down at that picture and I said, oh my god, that's Lillian St. Cyr. Are you kidding me? Because you only, you no one sees her in her own tribal dress. So that was a sign to me, because I always look for signs, even if they're not real. Okay. So, uh, so that was a sign to me to keep going on this project, even though you can't find the stuff you're looking for. So um, anyway, in 1903, what happens is that Lillian St. Cyr goes to stay with Chester I. Long, who's the, um, the senator for Nebraska. She goes to stay with his family. She says she was his protege. Uh, other uh, records say she was his wife's protege. And still others say more what I think was going on is that she was their housekeeper. <laughs> so now Julia, her sister, this is about the graduate. Julia, who's um, working in it, Nado, Nado, I don't know how to pronounce that, Kansas, um, is trying to get her into Hampton, probably to get her degree to be able to teach. Um, please, please, so she's writing to Dr. Crystal of Hampton saying, my sister, um, you know, we want to we want to get her in there. Please send her money for transportation. And across the letter it says refused. And that probably had a lot to do with the reputation of the St. Cyr kids at, at Hampton, which I won't go into. Um, but, um, in October 6, 1905, there's a little blurb in the arrow saying she's here for a short visit. So what happened was the senator from Kansas goes and lives in Washington, D.C. now, and she comes with him. Next thing you know, she's married. So she, um, she gets married on April 6th to, is that what it says? It's like nine. April 9th, sorry, April 9th, 
And um, to, uh, to J. Younger Johnson, a young man of Indian and Spanish descent. And when you ever you see Spanish descent at this time, you know you need to like look at that carefully because there's something about that that has to do with, we don't know why his skin is dark, so we'll just say he's Spanish. But the marriage record shows them both listed as black. Now Lillian St. Cyr was an African American, but for I don't really know laws, maybe someone who was African American wasn't supposed to marry, I don't know what they were in Washington DC, usually you could marry native people, you could marry white. So anyway, they're both listed as black. And voila, after the marriage, there is Princess Red Wing. So she takes on this persona about 1907, 1908, and she and her husband start performing um, at the Hippodrome at the, in Pioneer Days. So the Hippodrome is this big place in New York. Then they're performing all over, and they're performing with a guy named Chief Charging Hawk um, from the Pine Ridge Agency. And basically, I love this part that um, Young Deer is interpreting Charging Hawk's tale of Custer's last charge, and Red Wing, his pretend 16-year-old sister, sang songs in her native tongue and English. So they're basically both playing Indians, Indians playing Indians too. Um, for as performers and getting and probably getting paid okay for it, as I was talking about. This is a very blurry uh, picture of them, which I would love to have the original when I found in the Brooklyn Day of Daily Eagle. There's also a guy named Falling Star with them instead of Charging Hawk. I don't know if he's who he is. I don't know if he's white or native. But another picture of Lillian, kind of before she's wearing some of the more cheesy costumes that she wears later. This is a painting of um, Charging Hawk. And this is a, from a newspaper article in 1908 at, where they visited the Gotham Club and they you know, provided entertainment. Chief Charging Hawk, Princess Red Wing, and Young Deer highly painted Indians danced to the rhythm of the tom-tom. Afterward, Red Wing sang My Navajo and Arowana. So it's, she often also later sang Red Wing, which is supposedly attributed to her, but I don't think that's true. Okay, so this is the White Squaw. Her first film role was in the White Squaw, which she talks about. Um, that isn't her. That's just a picture of the White Squaw. And then her, her career takes flight. So she appears in um, these films. I'm not going to read them all. Um, most of them directed by Fred J. Balshaver. And then she she and Young Deer, uh, Young Deer also acts in them. He, um, and they also become technical consultants or technical advisors. So what that means for Lillian, a lot of times was making costumes. <laughs> but she provided sort of the authenticity of the costume. But they also wrote, she wrote as well. And then um, she was, D.W. Griffith was the first person that she was a technical consultant for. Then later, um, the Bison Company and the Yenders moved to Los Angeles in 1909. Soon after, according to Angela Least, who's, who's done all the film history, Young Deer got his big break. Cafe Frères, the French film company, selected him to direct Westerns. His Indian perspective, bolstered by his authentic Winnebago wife, who starred in many of his pictures, cinched the hire. This is a film called Young Deer's Return that the Bison Company did released in October 4th, 1910. And then uh, they become sort of uh, fashionable at this period. So 1910 was actually a time, sort of a golden time for, I guess, educated Indians in show business. They were very uh, sought after and popular, kind of progressive era because of Teddy Roosevelt. So they are featured in the Los Angeles Times and staying at this very fashionable hotel. But in this piece about them, um, Young Deer is said to be a Winnebago Indian, uh, as well as Lillian, and both are Carlisle graduates, and that's not true about him. So that is some cachet in being a Carlisle graduate, absolutely. Then they're in Edendale, California, which is basically where kind of what Hollywood comes out of. 
all of these films she was doing in 1910, probably more. These are all very short films, so these aren't feature length. And then, uh, then there was a problem. Young Bear kind of was really into realism, and usually the person who suffered that was Lillian, because he, she, was, she was put in some real daredevil stunts. She rode horses, she rode horses in very dangerous situations, and he was constantly trying to get his westerns to be more and more authentic. The reason he was hired was because he was supposedly Indian, and so he, he was, you know, he was pretty good at kind of giving more of a voice to Native people at this time. Um, in fact, that's kind of his claim to fame. So she uh, ends up falling off course, and then I thought it was interesting that she also ends up going home right after that. So I'm thinking there's a little trouble in the marriage at the same time. You know, um, he he definitely had kind of a high risk taking behavior. He also. Uh, bought some property in Orange County called the S&M Ranch where they did a lot of their film work. And then in 1911, um, here's some more films that she was in. Now many of these were directed by him at this time. He's directing her too, he's sometimes acting, but basically they're this dynamic duo of actress and director. Then, um, I call this Young Deer's Pride, it's not the name of the film, it's the name of my slide. Um, because uh, recurring to the subject of directors who invent their own photo plays, a Los Angeles publication states that James Young Deer is distinguished as one of the few directors who writes all his own scenarios, and he is reported as saying that, quote, the only two that he has abused other than his own were failures. Goodness gracious, mercy on us. Did all his own scenarios turn out to be stupendous successes? What? So what's happening is he was very popular in Unidale and very sought after and kind of but kind of a braggart. And so he's starting to lose a little bit of his shine right now with, with the critics because I think it and had probably had to do with how he was conducting himself. Okay, so this is um but this is sort of the good side of, of Young Deer. He did, um, so these are films that Lillian did in 1912, and the, the Unwilling Bride, this is a review in Moving Picture World, which was a really big uh, movie rag for the industry. And he's saying, it was a pleasure to watch the unfolding of Pathé's Indian release, The Unwilling Bride. There, was, there were no burnings, no scalpings, no portrayal of the red man as always bad, the white man is always good. It was the picture that would extract a grunt of satisfaction, unfortunately that's in there, from the genuine aborigine. And it is a fact that the Indian is a moving picture follower second to none in his steadfastness. The unwilling bride depicts the Indian as he is understood by those whose knowledge of the red man is gained from... Uh-oh. Plug in, plug it in, baby, I need it. <laughs> Um, is gained from sources more authoritative and reliable than the average Indian drama. The directing of James Young Deer is at, of the best. Its distinctiveness insofar that it is not the white man's way and that it is the red man's way is its chief charm. And unfortunately, it wasn't really of the red man's way, but his wife was there guiding him. Princess Red Wing, who played the bride, materially enhanced the naturalness of the story. So during, uh, in 1913, Lillian, and this is her sister Julia, who was uh, known, known as Indian attorney, appear in the Omaha World Herald with her son Leo. I love that picture on the right because I've never seen that. And the, it's a really cute little, it's actually a really long article where Julia is talking about rights of Native people. I, it's like nothing I've seen. It just, they, they totally quote her verbatim for column after column after column. So it's really a wonderful uh, thing that you say, wow, they're letting her talk this much. Wow, and she's not grunting at all while she's talking. She's talking a perfectly you know, articulate, educated woman. But they also talk about her beautiful sister, and the thing that's really adorable here is she says that when she first saw her in the motion picture, um, 
she was seated on a pony in Indian trappings, and so surprised was the Indian lawyer that she cried out, that's my sister, that's my sister, to the amazement of people surrounding her. And they both at this time say, she, like her sister Julia St. Cyr, Lily and Julia, hope someday to see the Indians governed by their own race. So, go, go Omaha Herald. Now here's, things are gonna switch now. What happens is James Young Deer gets fined for, um, well his, his people get fined for inhumane treatment of a horse. And I mean, this is kind of a disgusting story. They're making a film, and this horse is half dead already, and he decides to, he wants it to fall off the cliff, so he decide, he rigs up this thing where it says, half dead though it was, the horse seemed to sense the conspiracy and refused to go near the edge. After a number of unsuccessful attempts, it was, it was concluded to hop tie how tied the animal, that is to fasten its legs together so that a push would send it over. The horse was led to the edge of the cliff, but while its legs were being tied, it began to scream like a human being and to struggle. A number of women living near the spot thought a child was being injured and ran out to investigate. They were witnesses to the act of pushing the horse over the cliff and complained to the authorities. So anyway, it goes on, but this, this pissed off the film industry, and the reason it pissed them off is because it made them look bad because other people were probably doing some of the same thing. And the fact that it was witnessed by local citizens, I believe that this, there's another, um, there's another thing that he does next that people think is what kind of doomed him. But I believe this is the beginning. It's what he made the film industry look bad. So immediately, oh sorry, immediately after this, this little article, like a PR thing comes out, probably to, to um, cover what just happened. And it's this beautiful article on Lillian about the, art, the reporter going to her home and seeing the little picturesque Indian girl with her braids sitting on the bed doing her bead work. And at the same time, she's fearless and she can do her own stunts. The most picturesque little maid I ever saw, I thought, as she put on a very soft little hand for me, put out a little a uh, soft hand for me to shake and lifted her eyes from the delicate bit of fancy work. So basically, I think this was their attempt to kind of make better for, for what had just happened, but it's not going to work. <coughs> Next thing you know, a subpoena was served upon James Young Deer, an Indian actor who was wanted as a witness in the cases of William LaHaye's and Richard Hollingsworth, automobile dealers charged with criminal offenses against Evelyn Quick, 15 years old. And basically, there was this whole uh, scandal that came out about a white slave ring, and um, somehow Young here is implicated in that. So this is May 2nd, 1913, the same time that article came out. Next thing you know, James Young here is in England. He, he, skips, he skips bail, goes to England, He's, he's indicted for contributing to the delinquency of Marie Wilkinson. Anyway, there's a lot of stuff about this that um, the point is, is that I, I really affected the rest of Lillian's life and the rest of his life more so. So the next thing is that uh, he writes a letter, pleads for justice, and um, basically said, he basically says it's racism against Indians. I, it may be that someone figured out he was black, and that was racism against, you know, so we don't really know. But um, he, he gets out of it. He finally gets to come back into the country. But while he's in England, he, he starts making films there as well. So Lillian, at the same time, her, her career kind of rises and actually peaks because she is selected to be in Squaw Man. Cecil DeMille Squaw Man. And I, wrote, I put this up here because uh, Luther Standing Bear, she'll talk about Luther Standing Bear as the person who kind of introduces her to around in Hollywood. But also Mona Darkfeather, who is sometimes mistaken for Lily and St. Cyr, was the person that Cecil DeMille wanted for the role. And she was of, uh, she was of um, Spanish, Hispanic ancestry, but she was busy, so she didn't, she didn't get the role. So here's the first moving picture world when the film is coming out, The Squaw Man, and as you can see, Lillian is on the right of Dustin Harmon there. 
This is May 28, 1914. This is a, a PR shot of her in one of the dresses from the Squaw Man, and you'll see which one at the end. This is an advertisement for it. And this is a French advertisement for it, but also this is the dress that the Wisconsin State Historical Society has that was, ho was hopefully going to be here, but it's not here today, that um, Lillian's, the person who was with her when she died, claims what she wore in the Squaw Man. And she, she died in 1974, so it would be a very old dress. So it's either the dress she wore in the Squaw Man or a reproduction she made of the dress she wore in the Squaw Man. This is the cast of the Squaw Man. This is the, I thought you would have seen the Squaw Man. I thought it was going to be playing, so I'm just showing this stuff. This is the dress again. And she's, maybe she made the necklace there too. And then this is, I would have, this is because I'm bucking with the 1491s. I have the two funny lines in Hello, Handsome. That's when she meets Dustin Barnum. And then I would Because that is like basically what's happening there is she's going to get her pregnant. So I thought it was cute that she looks like she's a little girl. Okay. This is um, this is a um, interesting clipping that talks about that she was actually shot in the last scene of this woman. <coughs> this poor woman, first she falls off a horse. So somewhere when they're filming the scene, she gets shot in the arm, and she just keeps working. And the thing you need to know about Lillian is that she's a go-getter, and she's very peppy pretty much until the day she died. So she, that kind of stuff just didn't phase her. I'm sure it did phase her, but she would never show it. So this scene, which is the famous last scene, when she's committed suicide, and there the white woman is taking her child away because that child has to be raised with white people and get an education, blah, blah, blah. She's actually shot in the arm. In there. So that swoon is for real. OK, so this is a very wonderful uh, quote from her, her co-star, or the star of the Squaw Man, Dustin Farnham, who's talking about making the film. And he says, Little Red Wing came to me one day when we were getting near the end of the picture and told me she had a beautiful pair of horns from a longhorn Texas steer, which one of her relatives had mounted and of which she would like to make a present. Naturally surprised and perhaps pleased, I tried to tell her how much I would appreciate the gift and how extremely generous she was when I noticed her looking at me very fixedly, probably like that. <laughs> Just say yes or no, she said shortly. In spite of education, she got dead right down to cases. When we were rehearsing the scene where the baby is taken from Natchez to be sent back to, the Eng to England, and this pure-blooded Indian girl broke down and went into hysterics, it was pitiful. It was 25 minutes before we could proceed with the picture. In all my years on stage, I never saw anything like it. It was absolutely the reverse of what we had been taught about Indians, like the stoic, right? The thing about that that always struck me is, in my mind, I'm always looking for what happened to a baby for Lillian St. Cyr, you know? And I, in this five minutes, no way. Okay. Um, so, if I feel when I read that, I feel like there's maybe there was a baby or there was sadness that she never had a baby, but something something happened when in that scene, or the fact that she was taken away as a baby, you know, as really a little as a baby, five years old. So now she's living on Sunset Boulevard, and here's her glam shot to go with that. And a weird picture, but probably pretty for the day. Then she, um, so her career is almost over. She bought the state rights for the Tom Mix pictures, um, like Days of Thundering Herd, and traveled in many states with the pictures, giving an educational program in conjunction with the pictures. So one thing that Lillian did, and I didn't really get to talk about her activism, is that she went and she did these kind of, these pictures, but then she would go to the movie theater, and sometimes wearing her Squaw Man dress, just sometimes doing a little song and dance, but then she would give a lecture on sort of real Indian culture. And that's how she dealt with this issue of, um, of the sort of fake Indian stuff. She was in Ramona in 1916, playing Ramona's mother. She's getting older now. 
And then she goes to Klamath, Oregon, supposedly to, in 1962, uh, research a role, but nothing seemed to come out of that. She um, taught, but she does talk about um, standing there and says that he gave her the name Red Wing. I never saw Indian names for any of the St. Cyr kids but the oldest brother, and I, I was suspicious that that name came from the tribe. There's only like one Red Wing out of thousands and thousands of people, it's a guy. So, the, and the way it's spelled, it's not spelled in the Winnebago way, so that's probably where she got her name. She also wore her costume at the, um, and, and then let it be displayed at these venues she was in. And then um, the next thing you know, she's in Sioux City, Iowa, which is right above the reservation, and she's applying at the unemployment agency to be a maid. So her career basically was over. She only had a couple more films. She was, you know, she said she'd done office work before, and uh, the, the woman at the agency said that it would not be dis distasteful to one who wanted to be near the home of her people. So the Indian girl who wanted a place to work and the housewife anxious for a house made a little better than the average were placed in communication. The agreements were made and this year went right up to her new place this morning. So pretty quickly, her career was over. At this time, um, her brother had his own trouble, David. James Young Deere is registering for World War I draft. He still claims her as his wife and that they live in Los Angeles, which isn't true. Um, Lillian's living with her family in Emerson or near Winnebago. Uh, she, she also pairs up with White Eagle Davis, so I'm not sure if that's another name for Richard Davis or, and they start lecturing and entertaining in school venues. And then her sister's in Washington, D.C., sometimes a lawyer, sometimes a clerk in the Western Union. And then her other sister, Minnie, dies, leaving three daughters, which will eventually head to New York with her. This is where she lived in Omaha with her brother, Louis, in 1920. And after her uncredited role in the feature-length film, film, White Oak, starring William S. Hart, who you may have heard it, and uh, her friend Luther standing there as Chief Long Knife, like Chief Long Lance. Um, she's left to reinvent her career. So she does the vaudeville kind of circuit, what they call vaudeville, um, and pairs up with a, a kid named Norman Tyndall from the Omaha Reservation. And she just kind of goes around, I basically think she just goes around the Midwest. This is the Colonial Theater in Nebraska where she went. And she's also taking those, that's that film of Thundering Herd and playing it and talking about it afterwards. So the next thing you know, in 1925, she's in New York. She marries Joe Eaglefoot, the, the entertainer. That marriage is over very quickly because he remarries in a couple of years. I don't know when this was taken, but obviously when she was older. And I'm going to play this real quick. I don't know. It's about five minutes. Um, oh. I guess I won't play that. So we'll get that one. So in 1935, she's featured in a newspaper article um, as because of Cecil DeMille is, is kind of the squaw man reputation, he's having reunions, and she's talking about, I haven't done any picture work since then, today I lecture in the public schools on Indian lore, singing native songs and teaching sign language. Also I made Indian things, I made the costume Norman Talbot wore in the heart of Watona. And here she is at a reunion uh, with Cecil DeMille in 1953, looking pretty good, I think. And then this is the big piece that the New York Times did on her, a guy named um, Berger Meyer, who also, he was a pretty well-known columnist. This is a picture that was taken with that other one at the beginning of the, my presentation, and this is the newspaper picture. Like I won't have time to really talk about that. But it's a really wonderful article I can send to anybody if you're interested. It says at the end, um, so she's talking about basic, it's talking about the things that she makes and the beadwork and the headdresses and how, where she gets all her materials. 
Um, says after Red Wing got out of the movies in the early 20s, she worked on Indian costumes for FAO Schwartz and for the East Theatrical Costume Company. The buyers in those places who knew Red Wing and her work died, and she lost that trade, though no other worker in the city maintained her high standards. That was a huge part of it. One of the things that we haven't really talked about is though they are dressing, dressing in these ways, part of the craftsmanship that they're doing, they're doing in the traditional way, and that was really important to her that her work was done in the traditional way and sort of perfectly it wasn't just thrown together like some of the costume stuff you could buy at this time with headdresses and things like that. Every color used by Rupa Hu Shaolin, which is the red wing in a different language, has definite traditional meaning. Red for life, blood, blue for sky, yellow for sunlight, green for earth, blah, blah, blah. Beaded triangles in her brow band stand for mountains, floral and leaf designs go to beadwork for Indians of the plains and forests. Red Wing doesn't, as she puts it, do much socializing now, but whenever the Quakers ask her to sing, dance, or lecture for them, she puts on her ancient buckskin dresses and hurries to oblige. The friends, she tells you, have ever been good to my people. I would never refuse them. Sometimes she cooks special Indian dinners for church groups. Sometimes she entertains for the benefit of mentally retarded children. Then she goes back to her dark tenement lodge, this is in Manhattan, to sit with the faded wall pictures far away from the home of her people, but always with them in spirit. Um, at the end of her life, she was actually living with this woman, Yuffie Kimball Slayton, right before she died, and that's a whole other story. This woman pretended to be Osage. She was an artist, and she actually was a pretty well-revered Indian activist. And then this is a, um, an article in 1970, when you have the Red Power Movement. She's out of South, Southampton with the socialites. At the very end of the article, it's all talking about all the socialites and who's there. And at the very end, this is Betty Friedan, as you recognize the name. And others said it was time for another Black Panther party. So they did the Indian party, they're going to do Black Panther party. Red Wing, an 87-year-old Winnebago princess, said she'd never heard of the Panthers. All I know is Indians and how to make costumes for TV, she said. I was in the Squaw Man with Dustin Farman. That was Cecil Mill's first movie, you know. And that's how the thing ends. This is where she lived in, um, on 11 Bank Street in um, kind of near Soho, Greenwich Village. When she died, that's where she lived. And this is the, um, so we're almost done, I know I went over. Um, this is the best obituary I found for her from the Museum of the American Indian Quarterly. Uh, so she dies in 18, um, 1974. We deeply regret the passing of a good friend of the museum. Red Wing died on Tuesday, March 19th after a long illness. She was 90 years old. She was well known as Natchi Rich, the leading player in Cecil B. DeMille's 1904 film, Squaw Man, the first feature length film to be made in Hollywood. To many of us, an even more memorable quality was her fine craftsmanship. She was an excellent beadwork artist. She was a graduate of Carlisle Indian School, and following graduation, she played for many years opposite Tom Hanks and other stars of the silent screen era. She is the last of the true old timers, and the true and the tune Red Wing will always remind us of her vitality and beauty. So this is her headstone. On she was actually she was cremated, but her remains were sent back to the Winnebago Reservation. I won't be able to read that. Okay, one, um, so my last thing is her legacy. The American Indian Community House in Manhattan is, is run pretty much by her descendants, or not her descendants, but her sister's descendants. I got to visit there, that's my picture. Louis Mossy, grandson of her sister Minnie, learned powwow dancing there with him. Uh, the Spider Woman Theater is part of her, Louis Motsi's sister was one of the founders. I went to the La Lama Theater when I was last in New York and saw a production by one of her relatives. Um, the Thunderbird American Indian Dancers, Louis Motsi's feature right on top of the headdress. And this is the full picture of her in her Winnebago dress. It's just sweet. That's how she would have looked. And last but not least, let's take one second. Where did it go? Sorry, I don't have it. I need to know that. What's going on?
I just. Um, Louis Moffey's sister, Josephine, had a son, Kevin, and Kevin has a daughter, Josephine Tarrant, who, it, to me, carries on the legacy of, whoops, Louis.